Tere kõigile and uh, welcome to today's uh, workshop. My name is Kaisa Hansen. I'm the one of uh, one of the organizers of uh, this uh, workshop and uh, here is also Margaret from Tallinn Creative Incubator. Uh, so together we we decided to organize uh, this uh, workshop uh, for you. And I'm very happy that uh, today uh, we have uh, great uh, speakers and uh, trainers uh, on board. I will first uh, introduce uh, uh, the topic and uh, and Pieter van uh, Os. Uh, so the, today's uh, topic is uh, circular design and uh, business uh, models. Uh, so we will uh, guide you through uh, how to identify and implement uh, circular opportunities in your company. And uh, this part will be quite uh, interactive. So hopefully uh, you will learn uh, a lot and uh, the workshop will be carried out by uh, Pieter, who is uh, the co-founder of uh, Circo. And actually, I, I discovered uh, Circo about uh, five years ago uh, when we launched uh, one NGO in Estonia called uh, Circular Economy Estonia. And we launched it uh, together with uh, Mairi. Uh, and uh, it was quite an interesting uh, journey. I remember we were looking for partners uh, from abroad. Uh, so we discovered uh, Circo and, and I saw that it's, <laughs> it's doing a great job and uh, this is something that uh, we should do in, in Estonia as well. And I remember that we were applying uh, for funding uh, from different uh, state uh, initiatives and, uh, and for that uh, funding we needed to find some partners from abroad. So I think I maybe even reached out to Circo. And, uh, but uh, the Ministry of uh, Environment uh, was not very uh, um, interested in this uh, topic then. So, so here we are after five years again and uh, talking about uh, the same uh, topics. But of course, uh, let's hope that uh, we will not uh, keep talking, but uh, we will take action uh, as well. And this is why we are organizing this uh, interactive uh, workshop uh, today. And uh, what is uh, cool about uh, Circo is that uh, Circo has actually supported over 1,400 uh, companies and uh, trained uh, over 600 designers in developing a circular business uh, proposition, uh, meaning uh, circular uh, business model, uh, product redesign uh, and service uh, component. So this is uh, definitely something that uh, we have to learn here in Estonia as well. And uh, the first uh, speaker will uh, talk about uh, the future uh, regulations uh, for entrepreneurs in uh, Europe. So this is also something that, uh, that you need to know uh, before uh, trying to uh, do some changes uh, in, in your company. So we have Jana Eispu, who is uh, uh, working in the European Commission uh, in Brussels uh, already from 2009. And uh, what is interesting is that uh, she has uh, finished uh, her PhD studies in political science uh, in Germany, and uh, she has worked in different uh, positions uh, and uh, with several topics. So uh, I think uh, she can give us a really good overview of uh, what, uh, what kind of uh, regulations and, and what, what uh, can we expect uh, from the European Commission. And actually, uh, I will not uh, do a long uh, introduction. I will quickly say uh, what's the agenda. So uh, in one minute, uh, basically, I will give a word to Jane, and then uh, Jane will do uh, a presentation that lasts about uh, half an hour. And then uh, around uh, quarter past uh, 10, we will start uh, with the workshop uh, uh, that is uh, guided by uh, Peter uh, Vanos. And then around uh, 12 or maybe a bit sooner, uh, we will uh, do a quick uh, summary of the day. So Jana, when you are ready, then I will give the floor to you. Thanks. Yes, hello. Can you hear me well, Lina? Yes. So welcome, uh, welcome uh, from my side as well. So um, um, I think the European Commission is very happy that you do such kind of workshops because uh, this is the this is the future topic, the circular economy, and uh, and it's also great that you have partners from other European countries uh, who have uh, 
interesting uh, interesting in incentives to to provide so um i will sh uh, start uh, um, sharing my screen uh, wait a second can you see my presentation now yes yes very good very good so I'm supposed to talk about where we are. Um, uh, so basically, what are the future regulations for uh, for uh, for entrepreneurs? And um, this is a bit uh, difficult topic in the sense that, as you know, the climate policy is very complex. So there are many many different things that need to be changed. So it's it's, it's very complex. I'm trying to give you an overview what is upcoming. So my aim today is to really show you the direction where the train is going to understand a bit better. What are the expectations? But of course, not uh, everything is sure at the moment, as the Commission is uh, making legislative proposals in the has made some this year, some are upcoming next year. And there is also the legislative process that will take place. So the member states and the European Parliament can still change the regulations. And in the very end, then comes the implementation on the national level. So that's why uh, we have to keep that in mind. So that what I what I tell you today is not uh, 100 percent that uh, that will uh, that will come, but that it's where the where the right goes to. So um, first of all, very short um, snapshot where we are now. So we know that. Uh, more than half of, of greenhouse gas emissions um, are directly linked to, to our use of materials. And um, and the consumptions, um, the consumption of materials is expected to double in the next 40 years. And the annual waste generation uh, is projected to increase by 70% by 2050. So that means that what we are doing in the moment, our economic model is not circular, so we need to change something. And it's not enough to change or do something uh, only in, for example, in energy policy, where we can save uh, up to uh, 55 percentage of the greenhouse gas emissions. But such a main, a big bulk of emissions also come, comes from how we use materials, um, how we use our products and how we produce food. That's why um, it's important also to take uh, steps in this uh, towards circular economy also to, to achieve a, a saving of greenhouse gases there. And um, by re reusing materials, indeed, we, we, we limit greenhouse gas emissions that emerge from this when we produce new materials and new products. So we save this. We save the greenhouse emissions from how we treat the rubbish. And uh, we reduce air and water pollution and we, we save money in the very end. So we can uh, uh, offer the same good services and products, but we save money because we reuse the materials. So, so this, is the, this is the circle um, in the moment. We take the resources, we use them, we consume and we give it to waste. And the idea of circularity is, uh, is that we, we conserve the energy and, and the resources in the product, which are in the products and we use, it, use them again and again. And the more we use them, the more we save as well. And I'm coming now to the concrete proposals, um, what the commission um, is, is, um, is doing so you give the you to give you the framework that uh, last year the commission um, published um, circular economy action plan um, that uh, basically lists all these um, initiatives um, um, that needs to be taken in the coming years um, to make our economy more circular. And this is really a really important part of, of EU climate policy. Um, the Commission has already started um, publishing those proposals. Um, many of them are in the pipeline. So the idea is to bring them all out uh, this and, uh, and, and next year. And uh, the, 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 the further goal is, I mean, the big goal is to make uh, sustainable products the norm. So what we have now,
uh, comply with it. It can also be that the resources that you use are becoming scarce. And so you need to substitute your uh, part of your resources or that the price volatility is uh, becoming very high. So you want to be more, have more stable prices. So then you also have to substitute part of your, uh, of your materials. Uh, it can also be that you are in fierce price competition for every uh, deal you make. And uh, by adding more services to it, you can maybe try to escape from that price competition on the sales moment. So uh, you get a lower relation with your customers, more service based, which has a more secure income uh, stream. It can also be that uh, part of your materials are now wasted somewhere in the process. Uh, while when you take them back and you refer refurbish them, you can earn a lot of additional income from that or from additional service contracts. So there, there are many reasons to do so. And I will, uh, I will list them during my presentation. Ah, Jana is back. Um, <laughs> I'm really yeah. sorry. Um, maybe you want to continue now. Because... No, no, no. Go ahead, Jana. You can continue with your slides. Uh, <laughs> I'm really sorry because I'm connected through the secure network of the European Commission. So, but it showed me that it's it's okay. The connection is okay. But now all of a sudden, yeah. Don't worry. Um, wait Hold a second. On. I open again my presentation. <laughs> yes. Yeah, there's always some technical issues, so don't worry. <laughs> yeah, it's um, outside of our influence, actually. <laughs> yeah. Wait a second. PowerPoint is opening. Mm -hmm. Great. It is just, it takes a few minutes until you, um, I did a restart to make it um, mm -hmm. Okay, so I sh share screen again. So, um, okay, you can see it again. Yes, okay, sir. let's hope that the let's hope that the connection will stay for the next uh, um, next uh, um, let's say fifteen minutes. <laughs> yes. So um, I spoke about uh, that there are 35 new initiatives that the Commission already published or, or, or intends to publish and um, to make the, the sustainable products the norm. And um, I want to say that the initiatives I'm speaking about now, some of them are still in the pipeline. That means that I can only speak about in which direction we are thinking, but it's not that it will be 100% um, uh, um, the norm. And um, the other thing is, as I said, it will go through the European Parliament and, uh, and member states in the Council, so they can change still. And the third thing is that not everything will come at once, but it comes step by step, by step depending of, of, of when, when different uh, regulations are ready. So, um, um, sorry. Um, so we are speaking about, <clears throat> um, so far we had different approaches in the EU, like uh, voluntary eco-label and so on. Probably you have heard about it. Um, it doesn't, it doesn't, it haven't worked well because it was not uh, enough encouragement to really change uh, to circularity. That's why now we are considering a, a wide, a broad approach and we are indeed considering also mandatory requirements for the products. So now in this uh, slide, I'm speaking about product design. What is meant? What is uh, what is meant to come in terms of how we produce products? <clears throat> um, we are thinking about mandatory sustainability requirements. <clears throat> so um, to improve the product durability, reusability. For example, that if a producer brings a new product on the market, it has to be usable for a certain time. Um, it has to be repairable and uh, it must be possible to, to recycle it or at least parts of it. We are also thinking about mandatory requirements for recycled content in products. What we have already now um, um, voluntary approaches where, uh, where, uh, where a certain uh, um, percentage of a product is, is recycled. We are making about, we are thinking about making it um, <clears throat> mandatory um, to enlarge um, um, its, uh, its, its use. 
Um, we are also um, uh, thinking about um, 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 inserting or having a digital product passport. That means that every product has a passport where all the information is, uh, is in about how it has been produced, is it recyclable, um, what are the components, um, are there any um, harm, uh, any chemicals um, um, which, which might harm the nature and so on and so on. So it should be a quite a comprehensive digital product passport. Mm, that would also ease um, um, for the consumer to decide if if it wants if he wants to 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 purchase the product or not. We are also planning to restrict single use products or short time use products. Um, that means that every product uh, must be uh, must be recyclable, reusable, um, and. Um, we are also thinking about a ban on destruction of unsold durable goods. As we know nowadays, um, many textiles, for example, which are unsold, they are destructed or, or thrown to rubbish. So that should um, disappear. And um, um, the commission also plans to promote the product as a service model that um, the producers keep the ownership of the product or the responsibility for its performance. There's a great uh, Estonian startup uh, uh, named Fairown who exactly uses this model actually basically as a consumer, you don't buy the product anymore, but you rent it. So you pay a monthly rent and the company gives you um, the most modern product um, and replaces the product after after a while if it uh, if it becomes old and the, the value basically goes down, uh, and the company um, then collects the products again and makes sure that it's recycled that the new new products are produced out out of it, just as an example. So this is what is meant by this product as a service model. And the commission also thinks about uh, rewarding different products uh, which are more sustainable. It can be made over taxation. Um, that is, um, so we are in discussions with member states about it. And we also plan to ban harmful chemicals um, that can make recycling very complicated. Um, for example, in electronics, textiles, and so on. So that was about product design. Now I'm coming to, to speak about consumer policy. Um, we are also thinking how to give more rights to consumers that they can make uh, right decisions towards sustainable products. And that will of course in turn also influence uh, the companies which kind of products they, they put on the market. So we, um, have the concrete plan to, to have a right to repair for electronics, electronic devices and information communication uh, technology tools so that every product the consumer buys must be repairable, what is not the case nowadays. We also um, plan a right uh, of the consumer on spare parts that the consumer knows if he, if he buys a product then um, if part of it uh, breaks down, that it's possible to replace. So it must be possible um, to repair the product. So the consumer must have uh, access to repair services. Mm. And what I already talked about also, um, the, the consumer would have a right on reliable information via this digital product passport that gives the most comprehensive um, <coughs> information <coughs> on the product, if, if you go to a shop um, <clears throat> that you know how it was produced, I'm sorry, <clears throat> how it was produced, um, which materials used, uh, um, if, if it's recyclable, in which ways, if it's repairable and so on, if there are spare parts and so on. <clears throat> we are also considering different um, uh, ideas uh, to, to protect consumers against greenwashing. For example, in a moment we have quite a quite a big chaos on the market uh, where um, many producers claim that uh, that the 
the product their product is 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 uh, sustainable but indeed there are no no there is no clarity what it means actually a product is is sustainable that means that um, we are thinking about minimum requirements in europe uh, uh, for sustainability labels and um, and we also plan to enlarge the mandatory green public procurement criteria. That means that if the public uh, administration, if the state uh, um, buys uh, services or, um, or products, that also sustainability criteria sh um, should be taken into uh, consideration mandatorily. So I'm... Um, um, now going a little bit into a couple of, uh, couple of uh, sectors, um, I want to bring some examples, what is already uh, in the pipeline or what has been published already. For example, in, in electronics, um, um, the commission has already made a proposal to introduce a common charger that can be used for, uh, for, for, for different devices that we don't have uh, separate chargers uh, that we then uh, throw away if we don't use the product anymore and buy from a different uh, company a new product. And uh, we are also thinking an EU-wide take-back scheme to return old mobile phones, tablets, that there is more system um, in, in this, uh, um, how we collect those devices and how, uh, how we um, uh, give it to, to recycling. Then coming to textiles, um, the Commission is, um, is about to propose concrete targets for separate collection of textile waste. We are not that far on Europe on that, so it should be, uh, there should be mandatory uh, norms how much uh, should be uh, collected separately. Also targets for reusing and recycling textiles, and we are also uh, considering targets for textile to textile um, um, recycling, because in the moment, what is very common is um, that we I think that Jana has frozen. seems like that. Okay, I saw that uh, uh, there were some questions. Uh, Pieter, do you want to discuss? Oh, they are for, the, they question? Are, the question is for Jana, and I think yeah. the other question also. So <laughs> what we can but, uh, do... We can I... already discuss in the okay. meantime. Okay, you said that by banning harmful chemicals, we will first see a gigantic drop in recycling rate. Uh, why, why is that, uh, Pieter? Uh, well, because if you want to reach, so for instance, the electronics or the plastics that are used in electronics, uh, there is uh, uh, material in it uh, to um, um, prevent from, uh, for, from uh, so anti-flaming. And um, if you want to recycle it, you have to prove that there is no anti-flaming uh, substance or additive in that plastic. And you cannot prove that. Uh, and so by the new regulation, you can only use uh, recycled plastics when you can prove that. So the result will be that uh, all uh, recyclers will say, well, I cannot take this plastic and I will just burn it in the incinerator instead of using it in, uh, in, in a new product. So these uh, regulations or these, yeah, these uh, uh, re regulations are so strict that uh, many uh, products that are now recycled cannot be recycled anymore. And that's because of health, health and safety uh, arguments. And so you have to consider if uh, by, uh, by, by doing so, so the, the health and safety will maybe improve, but you need much more new materials uh, made from uh, fossil fuels. So there is a, well, there is a big trade-off Okay. And then a very uh, relevant question from Ilya. Um, Ilya, maybe you can uh, raise that question yourself. 
yeah hello everybody sorry i don't have camera in my pc but um, i'll just talk um i have a quite a big experience on the recycling of plastics actually this is my speciality and uh, we came to a point now that um what's the biggest problem of it uh, not plastics themselves but all kind of additives uh, what are added to it like plasticizers uh, uv protectors uh, some everything and these uh, additives they are a problem and uh, to solve the problem of toxicity of plastic waste uh, we could do it quite easily by replacement of uh, harmful substances for non-harmful substances but this is very uh, difficult to uh, find now the alternatives because these um, uh, substances what we have sometimes they are really harmful uh, they are developed for many many years already they are tuned as much as possible to some specific application if we have a packaging of or if we have pa some construction building materials pipes and etc for each for each product we have special uh, uh, chemicals used and then if let's say in some time the, there will be a list what is banned then all industry will come that okay we have to replace everything or we have to stop producing it or as you peter said about we cannot just recycle it the our let's say pipe was recyclable uh, yesterday but tomorrow it will be not recyclable and uh, to um, make it let's say put it on the right rails we have to uh, make like a preliminary list of uh, harmful ke uh, chemicals give some years to uh, find an alternatives and what is actually really important is to control this because uh, it's very important to know what exactly you have put into the material because sometimes it's not so easy to identify after words when it is inside of a plastic what was used as a uh, additives or filler for it so yeah this is kind of uh, administrative pro uh, problem let's call it so but uh, it's it's very relevant yeah Exactly, and so the uh, EU is not very clear on what substances, uh, where they are in products, what they want to ban. And uh, so that makes it uh, very hard for companies to anticipate on this. And that's exactly, I think, what uh, Ilya is, uh, is, is referring to. Yes, yes. Yeah, I'm also thinking that uh, maybe if we have a few minutes at the moment, then we also have Kadi Genk here. So I know Kadi is soon organizing a very cool workshop. So maybe, Kari, you want to introduce this uh, workshop uh, in the meantime already? Or say, say a few words about it? Or alternatively, uh, guys, uh, I can start my presentation and when, he, when Janne comes in, I can uh, stop it any time. Uh, okay, uh, let's do it like this. <laughs> Thanks. So good morning, everybody. Um, well, I'm uh, excited to be here. Uh, so it's uh, in Estonia. It's very early still in the Netherlands, but uh, good to, to see you all. I don't know. Um, well, you you may switch on your cameras if you uh, if you like. So I hope there is someone after after uh, beyond every uh, black hole I see on my screen. What I'm, my name is Peter van Os. I'm working for Circo, and we are a circle. Yeah, there I see Rakmar. Hi, Rakmar. How are you doing? Um, uh, ah, and Christy, and okay, so that's good that there are also faces behind all those uh, black holes on my screen. Melis, uh, 
So um, I'm working for Circo. We are a Circo design program in the Netherlands. And uh, I will uh, first give an introduction on circular economy. And maybe, oh, I don't know, maybe some of you will, are very advanced in circular economy. So maybe then it's a little bit boring, but I hope to bring some new information. And otherwise you can also um, compliment me on, uh, on things that, uh, that you think are relevant. And uh, then after that, I will give a, a workshop. So then you have to work and as, uh, as all the visitors on circular design. So that's, we have a method. I will explain the method and you will redesign a stroller. And so hopefully then we can uh, hand over. Ah, Jana is coming back. So thanks for the presentation. Uh, Jana is coming in again. So I will stop, stop right now. I saw her coming in at least. Yes. <laughs> I'm really sorry. My time is anyhow over now. <laughs> I had already almost my last uh, uh, slide where I wanted to say that there are different initiatives also in terms of waste. So when we design products, then we have to also think about how we package it. So. Um, so the Commission also planned some initiatives, uh, how to reduce this packaging, so how to motivate uh, um, um, con to consider whether a package is needed at all and they'll have as, as less package as, as, uh, as uh, possible. Um, that was actually my presentation. I'm really sorry for this, um, for this breakups and um, I wanted to say it's worth of keeping a, an eye on what is coming from Brussels in the coming couple of years. Um, it's worth of uh, having an eye on the national discussions, how it will be implemented. And, um, but one thing is sure that um, we have more and more incentives and it's more and more rewardable to produce products which are um, um, produced in a circular way, which are um, reusable, which are repairable, and which can be or which can be recycled again. Thank you very much. I'm happy to send me you my slides um, that you can have a look at it. What what I did not manage to address. <laughs> That's great. Uh, thank you, Jana. If uh, if we have uh, any quick questions to Jana, then we can we can take some. For example, there was one question about uh, harm harmful uh, chemicals uh, from Ilya. Uh, Ilya, do you want to quickly uh, tell us your question again? Yeah, I could re repeat it. Uh, basically, uh, the problem is so that we have an industry, a plastic industry now, for example, and uh, we have uh, plenty of different additives used for different materials uh, at production. And um, some of them are good, some of them are harmful indeed, and they, it's, uh, it's proven by different studies. Uh, and the problem is so, when uh, the regulation comes to a banning of some harmful chemicals, then we will see the problem that companies uh, will have to find out uh, very fast some alternatives to replace it, or they will just say that uh, our materials or our products are not more uh, recyclable until we will find a new alternative. And this is kind of problem which has to be solved, uh, let's say, in advance. Maybe the some kind of preliminary list has to be developed, then uh, some uh, certain amount of time should be given to uh, industry to find out alternatives. Otherwise, indeed, as Peter also has said about this, that he, the companies will just uh, uh, stop marking uh, the, their products as recyclable just because they have no possibility to switch for alternatives. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's the question. So I, the question actually is how to um, d develop this list, how to run it into real industry. Yeah. Um, whereas I cannot answer in a very detailed manner in terms of, I don't know exactly what, how the regulation will look like. But um, what I can say is that before Commission makes a proposal on something, there are really quite complex um, uh, consultations 
um, going on between uh, with the industries actually uh, who are concerned by the changes. And there are uh, pilot projects and uh, and, uh, and really thorough discussions with the industries before a change is proposed. So um, I'm pretty, pretty sure that the, that the commission services who are actually um, busy with developing these concrete new norms, I'm, I'm really uh, sure that they are very much aware of the concerns of the industry because they are in constant discussion with the industries. As another example, for example, before now the Commission proposed uh, um, uh, something for the car industry that by 2035 we will not have uh, um, new cars anymore coming coming on the market, which are um, based on on di diesel and uh, and oil motors. So that was very broadly consulted with the industry, and it was uh, bef and the, com the industry said that it's doable by this and this and time. So this timing is fine. Only after that, the commission made the proposal. So uh, this is also the case for all other sectors. So we can be sure about that. Great, thank you. That's that's quite promising. Thank you. Uh, we also had one uh, question about uh, recycling and uh, reuse of uh, plastics. Uh, this was from Niels. Niels, do you want to tell us your question? Okay, I can also tell it myself. Uh, so the question is, uh, most types of plastics have only a certain number of cycles that they can be recycled. How can this be traced and what is the possible solution for an end product when plastic is no longer recyclable? Good question. I don't have the answer also right away. What I know that the Commission plans to limit the types of different um, packaging, for example, because in the moment the problem is also that we have very, very many, many different types of of, uh, of, of packaging, um, um, also plastics, so where the content is very different. And that's why also it makes it very difficult to recycle. So the plan is to, to break it down to a few certain types of, uh, of packaging to make it easier for recycling and uh, to make it to create this real recycling industry. But on the concrete questions, I'm happy to receive it um, by writing and uh, providing you an answer by, by writing. So after consulting with a, <laughs> with a specialist in Brussels. Okay, great. Uh, thank you, Jana. And uh, now we can continue uh, with uh, Pieter. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jana. Um, so you gave the perspective from a regulation and, uh, and policy perspective, and uh, I will uh, uh, have a presentation from a design perspective and let's uh, see where they meet uh, and also if, uh, if good discussions come, uh, come out of that. Uh, so I will restart sharing my screen. So hopefully you now see my screen, is that right? Okay, so um, what, uh, what I'm going to do, I'm going to give an introduction on circular economy uh, from a design perspective, mostly or business perspective. And then we have the interactive workshop as I already uh, uh, announced. So we're first going to look at uh, the circular economy context. And um, so what is very important uh, is, so why is it so important? Is it important to look at, uh, at, uh, at, at becoming circular as a country, but also as a company? Well, so if you look at this graph, um, there are many uh, uh, um, uh, materials that we extract from the planet uh, in this graph. And what you see is that there were flat rates of using them uh, up till the 50s. And then uh, the usage of all kinds of materials uh, really exploded uh, up till now. And it's uh, growing uh, rapidly. And uh, well, you can have large, long discussions about it, but so there's one, uh, I think, fair conclusion is that the planet will not be capable of offering us all the materials that we use right now, and certainly not when we grow like this. So there is uh, some, uh, there is depletion uh, coming up. 
At the same time, this is a graph that shows uh, how much uh, materials are still uh, available if you were born in 2010. And so uh, uh, in, uh, on the uh, higher side of the sheet, you see a baby in 2010. And if you look then at oil, for instance, at the time uh, that you marry, there is almost no, no oil left anymore. And um, so these are the perspectives from uh, very important materials. So if you look then at energy, so, um, well, there is still energy to a certain extent, but you know there are very long cycles in order to substitute from energy consumption. So we need, to, as an economy, we need a lot of time to do so. And so it's better to anticipate on that right now. And then if you look on all the green materials, those are the materials that are used for sustainable energy or renewable energy solutions. And then you see that some very important materials like antimony, but also lead um, are not that uh, uh, much uh, available anymore. And uh, that has two consequences. Um, and a very important consequence for a company can be that um, uh, uh, the prices for the materials become much more volatile when there's not that much uh, material, uh, when there's not that much material uh, available. And so in red, you see, for instance, zinc, and zinc, uh, the prices for zinc have risen about uh, three times in the last five years. And so when you are a producer and you lose a lot, you use a lot of zinc, then you have a problem because you cannot, uh, so that this will probably deteriorate, to deteriorate your margins because you cannot hire the price of your end product all the time. So either, well, you, uh, um, uh, you accept that your margins will shrink or you look for a substitute for this uh, metal, so for zinc. And if you look at this, so uh, you can think, well, these are all very exotic materials, but that's not the case because copper is also in this list and uh, copper is used in, well, many, many products. And what you see is that copper will become scarce around 2040 and that's in 17 years from now. So that's not that long uh, while we use it in every electronics product, well, I, well in, in many, many products. So uh, there's also then an incentive for companies to look what materials am I using? What is the availability of, the, of those materials? And do I need to substitute? And if you are going to substitute, then design will help you to do so. Then at the same time, um, this is a, a, a graph of how we use consumer products. And what you see is that we use consumer products for a shorter and shorter period of time. So that's indicated with the red uh, end of every graph. So uh, we have uh, a scarcity of resources. We put them in materials or in products like consumer electronic products, and we use them for a shorter period of time. So that is exactly going the opposite way of being more efficient with materials. And uh, uh, so this is also partly uh, due to consumers and their behavior, but also the way that, we, that producers bring uh, products to the market. And then if you look at this graph, so in many countries in Europe, we say, well, we do a lot of recycling. And uh, uh, so we are already doing a lot of uh, things. Well, we will get back to that later. So if, if and, and with the question, if recycling is really circular or not. But if you look at this, so these are gigantic uh, numbers that are uh, given here. So I don't know, uh, 92 a gigaton that is well that, that I can hardly imagine how much it is but that is the the, uh, the volume of materials that we use and then if you look uh, at the, the graph so what this this indicates that only 10 percent of all the materials that we extract and use in the European Union are recycled so are reused in whatever sense so even if you reuse it in a very di degraded way then it's in a 10 percent the 90 percent so 90% of all materials that we take out of the ground are put into a product and then brought, brought to waste or they are emitted in some way. So that material is all lost and you can never use it again. So um, although we claim we are good at recycling, these are the figures. And so this is everything that we, uh, this is the percentage that is wasted of all materials that we put into products. Then you can also look at this uh, graph. And so if you look at this, uh, well, this guy is very uh, excited with his goggles that he uh, just, uh, just found. Uh, but uh, if you look at this uh, picture, this is in the Philippines, 
you can say two things. Well, as human being, you don't want to live in an environment like this. So we should prevent from this. But this is also harming economy because if beaches are polluted like this, then tourists will not come to your beach. So there is a environmental uh, and a, a social argument to prevent from this, but there is also an economic uh, argument to prevent from this because this will harm the tourist sector. And that's the same for this uh, picture. So this is in Beijing. You see this, uh, this nice and beautiful building. Uh, it's designed by a Dutch architect and we're very proud of it, but you can hardly see it because of the pollution. And so this guy is wearing a mouth mask. And uh, at that time, that was not as common as it is now. Um, and so it's bad for his, his health to, uh, to use this, this air, to breathe this air. But at, at the same time, so if you have a, a company in Beijing about uh, 10 days a year, you have to close down your factory because the pollution is too heavy. And if you are a producer of certain goods and you have to close down your, uh, your facility for about uh, two weeks in, uh, of the, the 52 weeks that you work, that is also not good for your business. So pollution is then also having a economic uh, implication. And so the same here, so this is for destruction. So we uh, mine a lot of goods. We take them out of the ground and we do that not very gently. And so this is then what, uh, what happens. And so you might say, okay, nobody is living here because you see no house or no uh, road or whatever. So what's the matter? But uh, for instance, in Holland, um, uh, we uh, have a lot of gas and we took it out of the ground for 40 years and we earned a lot of money with it as, as a country. But now there are many earthquakes and houses are demolished and we have to pay a lot of money from public, uh, so from public funds in order to restore all those houses and to compensate for all the harm that is being done. So there's a lot of gas, it's extracted, it's used, and now we have a lot of uh, external cost in order to compensate for everything that is damaging. So um, there, that's also a negative economic and macroeconomic effect. So this is going very fast, but what the uh, what we like to 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 get abroad is that uh, so you can look at all things from an ecological or env environmental perspective, and uh, so from an ethical point of view, you can say well we should not want this to happen, but there's also an economical point in all these things. So also economically. We should prevent from this because as a company, you can not survive or there are very negative implications if we uh, keep on uh, uh, um, uh, uh, keep on having our econ economy structured like we have it right now. And that's in a linear way. So that is the um, uh, CE introduction. Then we look at it from a policy perspective. And uh, I, I'm curious to see what Jana thinks of it. Because um, um, this is the grid. So in Europe, there is a lot of uh, uh, preparation of, uh, of legislation and, uh, and other things coming up. And there is a Green Deal set. And so I put this, um, uh, this uh, graph in, uh, in my presentation. But then I added uh, the sheet that uh, Jana just, uh, just used. And so uh, what I then uh, circled is all the things that are mandatory. So there is a lot coming up and uh, for the climate uh, that might be very relevant to do so. And uh, of course, it's good that, uh, that there is uh, a policy set, but as if you are a company, this is all mandatory. So this is coming up and you have to comply in some way you have to comply with it. And uh, so then it's a question as a company, how are you going to deal with it? And you can say, well, I'm going to resist or I'm not going to do this, but at the same time, uh, as I just showed, there are many arguments to make that change also from an economic perspective. And then um, you can say, sit and wait till the re re regulation is coming. And then also as Elias already uh, explained, you have a long throughput time to make changes to su substitute additives from your product or well, whatever you want to change, it takes a long time. So maybe you can better anticipate on that. And so you already start thinking, how can I uh, um, how can I take measures in order to prevent from, uh, from these mandatory things that are coming up? And well, design can help you. And maybe you can even go one step further and you already started with it and you are one of the parties that is at the table with the EU 
and giving them feedback or input on how legislation should or could look like. So that is very important to, to realize there is a lot of legislation coming up and I'm not a big fan of all this legislation uh, because I'm well, there are some limitations to that and you also see uh, uh, big rebound effects in some sectors, but it's coming up. So you better be prepared and you better think as an uh, entrepreneur, what can this mean for me? And how is this? So what is the risk in it? But also what is the opportunity in it when I'm the first mover to anticipate in it? And then uh, giving you some perspective from the net. Is that we are material neutral in 2050. So that means that we don't bring any new materials to our economy. And uh, so every material that you use should be used before. So that means a lot of reuse, recycle. Okay, looks like we are not lucky today with the uh, connection. <laughs> No, but no, I can hear I can. you. Can you, can't you hear me? Yeah, we can hear now. Yeah, okay. you disappeared for a few, a few seconds, so continue. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, luckily, uh, I'm uh, so um, in 2030. Uh, so half of all the materials that are used have to be reused, or at least cannot be virgin anymore. And so when you bring so many products that you bring to the market right now will be. Uh, end of life around 20, 2030 and so you already have to anticipate now on how am I going to reuse then the materials out of that product or the entire product at that period of time so again that's a very so you can think well 2030 that's a long time uh, away from now but a product that has a, a lifetime of uh, of eight years or nine years um, uh, already is then in the scope of 2030. So that is uh, uh, what I have to say about the policy framework. And I don't know if Jana is still there and she has anything to add to this, but I don't see her anymore. Jana, are you still there? No. So then I continue because this is the most important thing that uh, that we are looking at, uh, at and that's on the business perspective. So what does this mean for uh, companies and for designers? Because we are a design program and we think designers are very important in companies to, uh, to pave new roads. And uh, this is a very important uh, visual and I will take some time in order to explain it to you. And um, so this is the, the value hill. And I'm first going to explain how they look, uh, how the value hill looks in a linear economy. So what you see here is uh, how companies uh, build added value in, uh, in a product. So first we source materials. And as I already showed, we are mining uh, materials. And most of the time that's not very, uh, very polite or very gently how we do it. So, there is a lot of damage while mining uh, materials. Then there is the production phase. And so we put a lot of energy and labor to this uh, to these materials. And then uh, a product is uh, coming out of that. So by manufacturing it, assembling it. And then there is also a phase of retailing. Uh, so you, uh, you, and, uh, you add some value to it and sell it to a customer. And then you have the magic moment of selling your product. So that is what is happening in a linear economy. So here, I, I hope you can see my mouse. This is the most important moment for a company because then you uh, sell your product, you get in your money, and with a little bit of luck, you never see your product again. And so you start making a new product. But at the same time, so the product is used by a user and the product is already then decreasing in value when the user is using your product. But what is even more happening at this point of time. So when the user stops using the product, the uh, value of the product is rapidly going down. Certainly when it's brought to incineration or when it's brought to landfill, then all the materials, all the energy, all the labor that is put in that product is going down rapidly at the end of life. And that is how we structure our linear economy. So then we're going to look at the circular economy. So how could the value hill look then? 
And it's the same value hill, but what you see uh, are some, uh, some aspects. So one is what can we do with material selection and material efficiency while uh, producing a product? So can we use other materials so with the selection? So can we use recycled materials instead of virgin materials? Or can we use materials that are much easier to recycle or that have a less, less footprint or that uh, do not uh, contain hazardous substances? Or can we use less materials? So can we uh, decrease our packaging or can we avoid using certain materials while in, in the building? So those are all questions that you can ask uh, when, uh, while designing and producing a product. Then what is very important, and that's the circular part of it, is closing loops. So what you see here, so the usage phase is already extended relatively to the uh, linear economy. So how can you extend the lifetime or the usage time of a product by, for instance, adding repair and maintenance to a product? or by educating a consumer that he's uh, treating it better so that it is uh, used for a longer period of time. So that's the first step. Then can you reuse or redistribute the product? So for instance, the mobile telephone in the Netherlands, people use it for only 18 months, and then there's still a lot of technical lifetime left. So can you sell that product to someone else who's going to reuse it? Or uh, so that's an, uh, one element. Or can you refurbish the product? So you take back the product, you, uh, so again, the mobile telephone, maybe you, uh, uh, you exchange the battery and maybe you give it a software update and you clean it, and then you bring it back to retail and it's sold again to a consumer. So you use the product for a longer period of time and also all the materials and the energy that's in it. And what you see, the value is all go already going down, but it's not going down to the lowest level. So you, uh, you, you, catch, you catch the product while the value is going down, you do something with it and you, make, and you make sure that it's used again. And so then what's about recycling? What you see here is recycle and it's very low on this value hill. So a lot of the value that's in the product is already gone because what you see is very, it's on a very low level. And if you take out the materials, yes, that's very good because you, uh, you retain the materials but you have to bring them into the production process on the left-hand side of the uh, value hill. And you have to add a lot of labor and a lot of energy again to that product in order to make a product out of it and bring it to the consumer again. So that is very important to uh, principle of the circular economy. So how can you maintain the, um, the value of the product as high as possible for a, as long period of time? And uh, I will get back to that later. So why can it also be very relevant for a company? So how can this create business open options for a company? And there are many options because there are business models that can, uh, can be uh, favorable for a company. And then the last thing is on closing systems. So in many systems, there's also a lot of leakage. So looking at all the packaging material you see uh, in your street and uh, going into the nature. So how can you close systems that the material is not so like the ocean, uh, the plastic soup in the ocean? So how can we prevent from that? So those are all circular uh, 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 elements. So then coming to the business perspective on the value hill. So if you look at the linear current economy, we focus or companies focus on a moment of transaction. But what the circular economy is then trying to bring is so how can you extend your involvement so after the moment of transaction with your customer and with your product? So can you stay involved with your product? And if you are also then involved with your customer, can you bring higher value to the customer and also earn money by doing so? So you preserve the value, but you can also then uh, create additional pockets for income. And uh, so that is an important question. And if you are involved with the product for a longer period of time, uh, and I will get back to that, then it's also very smart to anticipate on that and design the product in a way that you can maintain it for long or that you, you may, can maintain it for a longer period of time and that you can all the things. So for if you want to redistribute the product that you anticipate, so what changes shall I make in a product that is more easy to redistribute it? or more easy to refurbish my product. But I will get back to that later. So then uh, this uh, is also very important to notice from a commercial point of view or from a business point of view. So again, if you look at the mobile telephone, 
So a mobile telephone is uh, sold for around 600 euros. Um, uh, let's say uh, just an iPhone model. Then after 18 months, uh, people stop using it, at least in the Netherlands. And uh, we're a little bit spoiled probably. And then um, if you recycle the, the mobile phone and you get out the precious materials like uh, the copper, there's some silver in it, some gold, then uh, the value of the phone is 72 cents. Well, and so if that's your business and you make 10% margin on this recycling, then you earn seven cents. Well, congratulations. That's not really a business opportunity. If you look at reusing the product, then the product has a value of about 300 euros or 290 euros. And if you do that and you make a margin, so you get the product back from a consumer and you resell it for 290 euros and you make a margin of 10%, well, then you have 29 euros. Well, that's worthwhile. And then you can spend some, uh, some money on marketing. Like I buy your old mobile phone and I have a refurbished telephone for you. And then you can also uh, invest in logistics. So also from a business perspective, there's much more business opportunity when you reuse a product than when you only reuse the materials at the end of life. So that's, and that's valid for almost all product types. So then some uh, things, so uh, you can say, well, uh, the beyond the transaction, oh, so there is a typo in it, but uh, beyond the transaction, mode, well, why is that relevant for me as a company? And so maybe you should ask you this, yourself this question. So who is earning money with my product after the moment of transaction? And so we do that for this facade. Uh, we have uh, listed some things and there are many more companies than, that earn some money with this facade than you expect because there is a window cleaner and he's coming every two weeks and he's sending a bill every month. There is the landlord that is using this facade and uh, the energy consumption is reduced. So um, he is uh, saving a lot of money because of this facade and energy uh, um, uh, that's in it. Also the energy supplier that is supplying energy is also earning some sort of money with his energy contract. There's a facility service that is uh, maintaining this or uh, that is, um, uh, yeah, uh, there is also a maintainer that is, uh, is replacing some elements of it, of the windows and other things, and uh, maybe uh, uh, and um, also doing, uh, the, uh, having a maintenance service for this building. And there, and in the end, when you demolish this building, then uh, probably everything is going to scrap, but there is some smart person in this uh, in this demolishing committee that at least will get out all the materials and will earn money from that. So for many companies, they even do not realize that there are a lot of activities with their product after they have sold it. And so can you play a role as a company in everything that's happening here? Maybe not, but that's exactly what we are trying to find out or what the companies are exploring in our circular design program. And then another quest, a triggering question more for the designers is why do P users stop using my product? And then you would say, well, because it's broken down. Well, there are many, many more reasons than only when, because it's broke. Because, well, here are some, uh, some options. It's because people buy a product, but they did not want to buy it. So in, uh, in the UK, every UK uh, woman is said to have one regret purchase every month on textiles. So they buy something, they come home, and then their husband says, well, I don't like it, and they never use it. Once a month. I don't know if this, if this is true, but just imagine. Well, there are, and so there are many things why you stop using this mobile telephone, and not because it's broke, because, but because of another reason. And if you look at it, this is very important. What does that mean for the phone? Because it, uh, so the reason why people stop using it um, is determining two things. One, what is the value of the product? So when the product is a regret purchase, the te telephone, so you buy a telephone and you don't like it or you cannot use it or you get another phone from your uh, em uh, employer, then you can just reuse the telephone at a very high value uh, because it's still very good. And that's totally different than when it fall in the, uh, that, the, when it fall in the water because then there's no use at all and you can maybe only recycle it. And the other thing is it also determines the relationship between the user and the product. 
because if you have used a product for a very long time, maybe you are attached to it and you're also willing to give it a good second life because you have enjoyed the product and maybe you also want to give that to someone else. Or maybe if you have a very bad relation with the product because it was not functioning, you just want to throw it away and never hear about it. So this is very important to add for a designer. So why do st people stop using it? And what is the relationship uh, with the product at that moment for the user? And what's the value of the product at that moment? So those are very triggering questions. Then uh, two uh, things for other industries. So for instance, looking at, uh, at plastic packaging, um, uh, you might say, well, this is not valid for plastic packaging. And that's right, because if you look at this graph, so you make packaging, you consume it, and then the packaging has no value whatsoever because what to do with the plastic that comes out uh, that, that is left when you eat your ice cream or the, the, the uh, multi-layer packaging, nothing. And there is even maybe a negative uh, value when uh, people throw it into, uh, into to the, to nature. So uh, for this kind of product, we have a different, well, we have an, uh, another framework called products that flow, but I did not introduce my, the products at last framework that will come later. But for these kind of products, there will come regulation, and that's called extensive producer responsibility system. So that's EPR, what stands in the title. And so this is exactly where Europe is making a lot of legislation. And so as a producer, you will be become responsible for your packaging. And there need to be a system in order to collect that packaging, to, uh, um, uh, um, uh, to separate it, and to reuse the materials that are in that packaging. And that's ob obligatory. And that has to be organized on a, on, a, on a national level and there will come costs from it. Uh, and then the challenge is how can you design the whole system that is as cost effective as possible and that you can use the materials as good as possible. So that's also a design question when the value of the product is lower. Uh, so there's no value after usage, but even then there are challenges. And then, uh, oh, this is not that nice, but then also uh, if you look, another very important principle is the total cost of ownership of a product. And so I here have a, uh, an example for the construction industry. So this is for utility uh, buildings. So in the linear model, if you um, uh, build a, uh, um, uh, an office uh, space and you say the construction costs are 100, so just to build an office, it costs you 100 then in the first 50 years of using it, it will cost 500. So the cost of exploiting an office building is 500. So that's five times as high as the construction cost. And that's strange because if you build an office, everything, all decisions in the design of the office and for the building are just to minimize the construction cost. Well, you see here that most costs are not in construction, but in using the office because that's for maintenance, for replacements of elements, for the energy, for refitting it, for uh, also the re residual value. Then look at it at a linear, or so this is the linear way. So optimizing on the construction cost. If you look at the circular way of, work, of working, you might say, well, I, I'm going to make some changes to the design of this office building and instead of having uh, it heated by gas, I'm going to use a heat pump. And that is a higher investment because a heat, a heat pump is much, much more expensive than a boiler. But you will save a lot of money, money on gas and on maintenance of your boiler during usage. So you're not going to uh, optimize your design on the cost price and on the, so on the selling price, but you are going to optimize your design on the total cost of, of ownership. So for the whole 50 years of using that office space. And then you will make, probably you will make totally different decisions on how you are going to design uh, this office. And uh, the total cost over the total period will probably be lower. And so there is then a business in incentive to do so, because if you do it right, you can also earn much more money when you place a heat pump and you have a service contract for 50 years than only selling a, um, uh, a boiler once. And maybe this is a little bit abstract, but if, if you really dig into this, you will see that there are a lot of opportunities looking in a more circular way to this and having an extended relationship with your product and well, offering services and, and so on. So um, then 
during the presentation, I mentioned a lot of um, uh, um, uh, arguments why looking at circularity might be relevant for companies. And so there are many reasons. And so every company has a different set of reasons. And I don't say you have to look at it, but for many companies, it is smart at least to explore what circularity could mean for you. So here are some arguments for that. So that's saving the planet, being more resource efficient. And so, well, there, there are some companies, certainly the early adopters that want to do this, but it's resource scarcity or price volatility, as we showed with the scarcity of materials. There's government regulation. So uh, that's all about Janet told, it's coming. Maybe you should anticipate on it. It switched to a service driven model. So instead of selling and having a fear price competition at the transaction moment, if you add some service to your product, maybe you will be less exposed to this price competition and you have a longer relationship with your customer. So you have customer retention, which is very important for many countries, uh, companies to create customer retention. So a longer customer relationship. So and customer, uh, and throat cutting cost price competition, I already said, maybe there are also some cost savings. Um, there are, so uh, Jana also mentioned public procurement. So governments or, uh, or provinces or uh, municipalities in the Netherlands, they are now already having requirements in a tender on circularity. And so if you don't comply, you can net, not sell your product to a government anymore or to a municipality anymore. So that might be a, a thing. Also, your license to operate. If you see how much um, uh, how much um, uh, pushback there is on the plastics industry right now, so consumers not accept plastic anymore, at least not in the Netherlands. And so there is a very negative uh, uh, atmosphere towards plastics. And so maybe you even lose your less license to operate if you don't do anything about it. And phasing out hazardous substances, like Elias also said. So it has a long throughput time. So maybe you already have to anticipate on it. So I don't know for you as, as a company, maybe only one thing is uh, is relevant. Maybe there are some arguments, so so many arguments. So, but look at this and look. Well, maybe I should explore what circular economy can bring to me, as in order to create business, or maybe to med mitigate my risk of all things that are coming to me and that bring a risk for my future existence as a company. Um, then also, uh, Kaiser, are we still on time? Uh, is it going too slow, going too fast? Can you give me any feedback or other people as well? So I think it's going great, so continue. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then I continue with uh, an, an introduction on Circo. And of course, uh, I don't want to make a big sales pitch out of this for Circo, uh, but Kadi will tell you something about uh, the Circo program that we're also bringing to Estonia. And uh, I'm also proud about what we do. And this is also then the introduction for the workshop that we're going to do after this. So um, on Circo, so well, here you see some of our materials and people working with it. Um, so uh, we started with an academic framework. So at the Technical University in Delft, which is in the Netherlands, uh, some uh, of, the, uh, the, um, uh, of the staff, they started with, uh, uh, um, uh, with research on uh, how can we use products longer than average use at the moment and consumer products they started with. Uh, so how can we extend the lifetime of products? And they did an extensive re research and they came out with, the, with this book called Products That Last. You can uh, order it at Amazon. It's very interesting and there are many pictures in it. So it's also uh, very easy to read. And uh, they came with five circular business models and six circular design strategies that can, ah, Akadi is showing them. You can see, um, and so they come with five circular business models and six circular design strategies that you can use as a company if you want to develop a circular proposition. So a product service combination that you can offer to your customers and they are very helpful. So the other element that we took is, uh, so how can we use design and design thinking in order to, uh, because uh, in order to, um, uh, to push this circular uh, uh, development. And you need designers, uh, at least we are, um, uh, we are uh, convinced uh, of that because you should, if you want to 
to migrate from your current linear way of doing business to a certain way of business, then you have to rethink many things that you are doing for, for decades as a company. So you have to think out of the box and you have to uh, look for paradigm shifts. So you have to question everything you're doing. So, okay, I've been doing this for 20 years, but when I look with my with a in a circular way, maybe I can make improvements. And not only to become circular, but also it's good for a company. I think it's good for a company to discuss the way you work every once in a while in order to look if it's still the best way that you do it. So that's the function of designers. And then, so we made a method out of it. And um, uh, I will, uh, so during the workshop, we will explain the whole method. So I will not uh, elaborate too much on it right now. But we started in 2015, so that's a long time ago already. And so we have a circle track. So that's a three day workshop cycle in which we help SME companies, also big companies and also startups, but SME companies are our main target group in order to make their first step on circularity and to create. Uh, so what we claim is creating business to circular design. So how can they improve their business by using circular design? And what they do, they develop a circular proposition. So that's a product service combination they can offer to their customers with a business model. So how are they going to earn money with it? With uh, the product redesign. So what are the consequences for my product? So can I design it in a more smarter way in order to facilitate uh, my circular proposition? Uh, and what are the complementary services? Because if you extend your lifetime or your relationship with your customer, then probably you can add also services. And they come with a roadmap for implementation. So what do they do you need to do as a company to uh, make the transformation from your current linear way of doing business to your desired circular way of doing business? And so in the Netherlands, we um, supported more than 1,200 companies in the meanwhile. And we also have a one-day uh, workshop for designers. And we um, offer creative professionals, like we call them. And we hand over all our tools so that they can use them in their day-to-day -day business, either if they work with a company or if they are an external design uh, agency. And so uh, why is it relevant? Um, so if so for, um, uh, for companies, it's relevant uh, in, because it's a very easy way to explore what circular economy can mean for them and how they can make their business more future-proof by working in a circular way, uh, working in a circular way, and uh, being at the same time more effective with materials and more effective with energy, because uh, we always have a double target: so being more competitive and being more uh, uh, efficient with materials and uh, and energy. Then, why it's relevant for designers? Well, because we enable them with our tools. And uh, why is this uh, also relevant for, uh, for the government or for policymakers? Because you can have a lot of policies and that is also what the EU is doing. They're coming with a lot of policies, but you also have to support companies, but also put them into motion in order to start. Uh, you cannot only have a, bottom, a, a top down policy on circular economy. You also need to have companies and designers that start with it and that are going to experiment with new propositions and also feedback to the government what is happening when you come when you have a circular proposition what legislation need to be changed what subsidies might help so uh, it's to start the companies but also to get feedback for the policy then looking at circle so we started in the netherlands and um, um, we got to go get, get a lot of requests from other countries uh, to use our methodology and so we make it available to local partners we have done that in 11 countries right now. So the methodology is working and used in all the countries that you see in, uh, in yellow. And uh, so yesterday we had our first uh, meeting with all these hubs, which was very exciting. And uh, so that's what me makes me proud. And uh, so we are planning to launch the program in Estonia. Um, so that's also one of the reasons for presenting uh, here and introducing it to you. And so Kadi is, uh, is involved in this. And uh, well, so our ambition for next year is to have a hub in every continent. So that's why we're looking in Nigeria, Australia and Canada, but that's not too relevant for you, but that's only because that makes me uh, cheerful. Uh, but so we have our methodology and we make it available and we hope that uh, companies all around the world see an added value in using it. 
So this is the material. So we have a lot of materials. We have also made it uh, digitally available. And what is important, it's also about people. So we try to connect people and we know that, uh, so maybe um, uh, you are uh, considering uh, becoming circular or you're already doing it. And it helps when you bring together people that are having the same ambition because they can share information, they can help each other. And maybe in the long run, people don't want to help each other anymore. But now in the face that um, uh, uh, circular economy is still not that mature, we see that people want to together and to collaborate and exchange information so that's also what we've with uh, well and then um so uh it's it's so many companies in well, and well maybe i'm still there because because my internet is unstable, but um, you can always start innovation tomorrow. But well, I hope you saw a lot of arguments maybe to start it today, uh, or when uh, be bringing uh, the circle, you have an opportunity to start with it. But what we see is that if the joints we get, so um, it's worthwhile spending uh, the time on exploring what circular economy means to you at least most of the of about 70 percent of the companies that join circo they also start implementing what they have developed so what they then identify during the circuit track is that it makes sense to make the next step so that there is a value in circular economy and or in circular business and you should realize starting implementing is not that you become a full circular company or not really refer to, but that you make steps that uh, that make your company more circular and the companies do it. So there is a business incentive for that. So that is what most companies or 70% of the companies take it out. Yes, it's relevant to invest more in becoming circular. And so um, I don't know what I'm showing right now. So I have not idea but this is at least the website uh, that Kadi uh, and so then after that we go to the to the workshop but Kadi maybe you can explain about uh, all the Estonian language what is uh, on your website am I heard now great thank you um, thank you Peter and um, and hello to everybody participating at this um, event today so um, this page is uh, giving you the opportunity to register your interest to participate at the first circle track we're going to be launching in Estonia, putting a start to a hub uh, that could uh, make that dot yellow on uh, Peter's, um, Peter's map. Mm, I strongly encourage you to participate or let me know of your interest if you feel that methodology has, like this has been something you've been looking for to become a trainer and help companies to, uh, to implement uh, circular design principles in their uh, daily activities. So uh, yes, to, in collaboration with the Responsible Business Forum, um, we have been talking with Kaisa and several other um, organizations in Estonia with whom to help scale understanding what circular economy is in business because like Peter said the commission may be um, uh, regulating um, a lot the market with restrictions but this is because they're they naturally interfere where there are problems but the market will never be um, developed how the regulator mandates um, this is not how democracy works. So for the circular economy to really become a reality, companies should and the market should start developing circular solutions with the intention to earn profit. And understanding where profit is will very strongly be illustrated when going through the, the circle track. Um, so yeah um and also the hubs around the world are of course relevant for all the business not only to make peter happy of looking at the very colorful map but if your business uh, requires collaboration um around the world or even you are intending to ext extend your market to these countries then it's good to know that you have friendly faces of companies who understand what it is you do and are able to help you on the way so yes that's that's my 
two cents to this uh, presentation. I yeah, also so added the link to the chat that you can check out. Yes. So, uh, welcome back after this commercial break. Um, so maybe the methodology is bringing you. So, um, but thanks, Kadi. Um, one question, um, because now, so next slide, um, I'm going to start the interactive workshop. Um, is there a need for a five minute break 